everybody. So I'm, I'm Vaughn Welch, I'm the Director of Trusted CI, and welcome this morning for this very special uh, Trusted CI Virtual Institute session. So as part of the program for our fellows, we have a, a number of guest speakers talking to them about either cybersecurity or cybersecurity related matters. And this one is one that because of its uh, broad impact and we're also really excited about our speaker, we have made um, open to the public today and it's great to see so many of you join us. I know I've got a couple screenfuls of folks here, so it's really exciting. And so with that, it is our pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Victoria Stodden here this morning. Um, she is very accomplished in the area of computational reproducibility. And I'll just give a couple highlights of her biography since it's, uh, since it's uh, uh, quite lengthy. She's right now at the, the School of, of Information Sciences at the, the University of Illinois, where she's also got affiliations with uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, Coordinated Science Lab, and the College of Law and Department of Statistics and Department of Computer Science. Uh, she's been very involved chairing the NSF Advisory Committee for Cyber Infrastructure and also uh, a member of the, the Advisory Committee for the NSF SICE and has been involved with several very important um, AAS reports on the area of, of computational reproducibility. So with that, uh, Victoria, if you're ready, I'll pass the, uh, the virtual podium over to you and thank you so much for joining us here this morning. Well, thank you so much, Vaughn. That um, you you almost gave my whole talk in your presentation there. No, that was really, really nice. What a wonderful introduction. So it's it's really a pleasure to be here. I think what I should do is go ahead and try to share my screen and uh, I can put my slides up there. And I also um, uh, put a link in the Zoom chat, which I know some of you have seen, which uh, will link you to my slides in case you prefer to go at your own pace, basically, or, or click on some links or, and so on. Um, so what I wanted to do today, so I think that this is a really sort of very nice time to give a talk to y'all because um, we have actually just finished a National Academies report on reproducibility and replication in science. This report was published in um, April, and so the I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more in, in the talk, but the report itself was targeted towards the National Science Foundation and had a number of recommendations around uh, steps that both the community and the National Science Foundation could take around reproducibility and ways to think about it. So this morning, what I'd like to talk to you about in my few minutes is um, these notions around reproducibility and what it means so let me just go to my agenda here. So, so what it means in different ways to conceptualize it. So any discussion around reproducibility, um, at least that I've had over the last five years, it's not uncommon to find different interpretations of what reproducibility means, often based on just the experience that researcher is bringing to the conversation or that person. So um, I found it useful to sort of think about reproducibility in certain ways. Now, this is something where um, there are, I think, intersections and overlaps with issues in security and cybersecurity because one of the principal things we're doing in reproducibility studies is we're trying to actually re-execute um, possibly someone else's code with someone else's data to try to see if we can get the results they're claiming to get from their computational experiment. And so just right there, you can see there are a number of security issues that um, uh, that arise and they interestingly these issues are not something you necessarily would expect a researcher to be conversant in so if someone is doing um, you know code sharing and data sharing this could be any researcher very likely trained specifically in their domain of expertise 
and and that's their area of specialty. So I hope I hope this talk kind of opens up, sort of um, you know, plants some seeds for thinking about these intersections between security and reproducibility, particularly on the computational side. Okay, so um, the second thing I wanted to do in the talk was talk about actually uh, Vaughn mentioned this, these workshop recommendations that came forward in 2016. I'll move relatively quickly through those. Um, first of all, we built on them in the National Academies report from this year. And secondly, we don't, there's, you know, 30 minutes is not a lot of time to, to, um, to, to really, uh, you know, languish in topics. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is I'm not sure what the protocol is on these discussions, but I'm very happy to be interrupted with questions, particularly if we it opens up a discussion that possibly people may find more interesting even than what I'm talking about. So this I'm very welcome. So I'm not sure what the protocol is, whether people just jump in or whether they raise their hand, but whatever it is, it, it, it's fine, to, I think, to, if you have questions as we're going through. Yeah, so Victoria, what we normally suggest is if people type their questions into the chat window, I'll look for them there, and then probably at your slide breaks, um, jump in and, and convey them. Okay, no, that sounds wonderful. Okay. Okay, so I think there's a there's three ways to start thinking about issues around reproducibility and I put this slide in, even though I think many people are aware of most of these points, but I put it in because there is a one part of the discussion around reproducibility that is centered around bad actors. And so, you know, you'll see some people enter the discussion in reproducibility thinking that the problem with work that doesn't reproduce is because of researcher sloppiness, is because of fraud on the part of researchers, is um, other issues uh, that, that come down to misconduct for researchers. I think these, so that certainly happens, right? I think it's a very small percentage of reproducibility issues and are certainly serious, um, but I, I think that misses the entire technological transformation that has happened to science over the last 10, 15 years and these technological changes that I'm about to enumerate are really driving rethinking about how we carry out the research that we're doing when it has a computational component and what does it mean to disseminate computational research. So from in my perspective, fraud and misconduct, bad actors and so on, they don't enter into that thinking. This is really about a healthy community and trying to understand and think about new modalities that have leveraged and accelerated research and what does that actually mean for things sort of old school, you know, um, cornerstone aspects of science like reproducibility, verifiability, transparency in the work, you know, understanding and communicating the research. So what does that mean for computational research? So we have, I, I just pulled out three sources here that I think are, are important. Certainly, of course, um, data, what gets called big data, but doesn't necessarily need to be big in size, but data has certainly pervaded almost all aspects of research that we do, at least in the academic um, field. It has um, uh, made, a, made a place for itself, and even in things like English departments, studying texts, for example, and digital humanities, all the way through to, you know, leveraging really massive data sets on machines at scale, for example. And we are developing new methodologies all the time. So data, for example, that has many more um, variables and observations is high dimensional data. How do we develop methodologies to deal with this? So there's sort of all these different fronts in which data has become a um, pervasive and um, new opportunity for research. And needless to say, the data is all digital stored in um, some type of uh, either warehouse, archive, could be sitting around on the web, but we have some type of digital aspect to just about all the data that's being analyzed. I would even go out and aggressively say all the data. Okay. Um, the second thing is all of these um, changes in the um, production, collection, and storage of data have been accompanied by increase in computational power, which now we're seeing this leveling off in Moore's law, but this, and, but even though we are actually still accelerating our computational power, but this has all of these increases over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, and they've allowed us to ask new questions as researchers and scientists, like, for example, ever more complete uh, simulation of physical systems, 
where we can vary the parameters, redo the simulation, try to understand how that system actually changes, and with appropriate mapping back to understanding the real world, so in other words, appropriate modeling, we really are asking new questions and answering these new questions due to the computational power. So those two, I think, are sort of well-known. People have some sense of these changes going on in our community. Uh, the third one, I think, is not as well-known, but I think it's just as important, which is, now think about researchers working on data or working with, um, you know, accelerated computational power now. And on either of these systems, much of the work that is happening from a scientific perspective is now happening in code. So we had a situation, say, 20, 30 plus years ago, where experiments were largely in physical reality in some way, right? You're at a lab bench or you're doing some physical experiment. And when these were communicated to the community, this is often done in writing, right? And that was appropriate because I had done some physical real world um, you know, action, and then I was reporting that action. Now we've done this, you know, massive transformation where our experiments have a computational digital cyber basis. So what's one of the things that's going on is now you see the design of experiments, implementation of experiments, reporting of experiments happening in software. You see real intellectual and scientific contributions occurring in the software. If you think about the implementation of the codes, methods for um, analyzing the data, for example. And this is not, I don't think, recognized yet by the community how important the software is from an intellectual perspective. So um, I have this picture sort of sitting there in front of you that's Lior Patchter, who um, says UC Berkeley, at the time he made these comments in 2013, he was at UC Berkeley, he's since moved to Caltech. But this is a keynote that was just happened to be on YouTube where he is talking about um, uh, the interaction between uh, software and biology and discovery and so on. And he has this um, sentence in there where he says that the software contains ideas that enable biology. So I think this is something new when we're thinking in this space to pay attention to that it, the traditional paper is now not the only source of intellectual advancement in the sciences. So where does that leave us? So I believe that just about every discovery today has some computational component in it either in the data, in the analysis of the data, somehow we've used and leveraged computational infrastructure in making those discoveries for just about everything we're doing today. And a corollary to that, um, perhaps bold claim, is that we don't disseminate our research like as if that's the case. We disseminate our research like it's 20, 30 years ago, where we've had some physical experiment that we're writing up in words. And so this creates a mismatch between the actual work that we're doing in the academic research community in general and the product that appears as the publication. So why is there a mismatch? Because we have not incorporated these data elements, code elements, transparency elements around the computational steps, and this is what's leading to the reproducibility concerns. So I put aside our notion of um, you know, bad actors, misconduct, poorly conducted research. This isn't a case of poorly conducted. This is a case of what do we need to do to bring transparency and reproducibility the way that we've understood it into this new way of doing science, new, like 10, 20 years new. Okay, so I pull out, uh, or at least I have found it useful to pull out three different categories for the discussions on reproducibility. I think there is a discussion going on around what I call empirical reproducibility. So here, um, this is our traditional 20, 30 year old style of work where we do physical experiments and then we report them, that type of work still goes on and you know it's very successful and so on. Now, when people talk about reproducibility concerns in that domain, they tend to talk about things like pressure on postdocs, how the work is executed, and so on. And this tends to be, at least what I have seen is this tends to be a discussion that emerges from the life sciences and from biology. I think this is a separate discussion from discussions around were your statistical methods um, employed correctly on your data to do the inferences and, the, and, get, and get the results you're actually um, claiming as you do your publication. <laughs> so that one I call statistical reproducibility. Roughly, have you used the right statistical methodologies that you would expect these claims, these findings that you found using them, those methods, to actually 
appear in new samples. So it's our sort of classical definition of statistics. That's very different to have we um, somehow distorted the incentive system within our empirical research such that we see reproducibility issues creeping in. And different again is computational reproducibility, though this is roughly geared towards um, whether I can um, understand, possibly re-execute, and have some level of transparency in what computational steps were taken in order to um, get the results that, we, that are actually being claimed. I tend to focus much of my work in computational reproducibility. I'm very interested as well in statistical reproducibility. Of course, there's overlap between these three, but there tends to be in the community sort of these three different discussions going on at the moment. So I have a few slides coming up where I illustrate each of these. I'm just gonna move past them in the interest of time, um, but you do have my slides and you're certainly welcome to take a look. Um, I'd like to just rest here on computational reproducibility um, since I think this goes to the subsequent discussions that we're, we're about to have. So one way of thinking about how to frame or sort of intellectually frame computational reproducibility is um, we might think back to what actually allows us to distinguish an activity as scientific versus you know, non-scientific activities. And we have traditionally, as I'm sure everyone knows, traditionally had two branches to the scientific method. Our first branch uh, being deductive reasoning, like mathematics, formal logic. And our second branch being inductive reasoning, or the empirical branch of the scientific method, where we carried out statistical analysis of controlled experiments. There has been um, talk for the last, I would even say more than a decade, around the possibility of new branches of the scientific method being um, uh, created and extended by technological change. So specifically by our large scale simulations and data driven computational science. So I snuck in a little question mark here, branch three, four, question mark. And the idea is I'm not quite sure that we have um, full branches of the scientific method due to these computational changes. And here are the reasons why I think that. Okay, so I, I looked around on the web, um, essentially very quick Googles. The, these aren't, the, there are many examples like this and not meaning to sort of pull out one example over any others. But on the left, you see a sort of pretty basic HTML um, web, page, web page here. You can see it's from 1995. So this is a strategic planning workshop on modeling and simulation that was hosted by NIST. And uh, they have a little quote in there that I pulled out. And the quote says, in 1995, it is common now to consider computation as a third branch of science besides theory and experiment. Um, on the right, so this is just a screenshot of a book that came out a few years ago now. It was a, um, this is an edited volume. I think it was sponsored by Microsoft. It has, you know, fantastic work in there and, um, you know, lots of different chapters by different people. If you just look in the um, preface of this book, it says the book is about a new fourth paradigm for science based on data intensive computing. So there's a lot of kind of acceptance in the community of these ideas of this third and fourth branch of the scientific method. But if we step back and we think about, well, what would allow me to claim a branch of the scientific method over something else? Is it just enough to have new technologies and go through scientific motions? What's really behind this? Um, one of the things that the um, scientific method allows us to do, or one of, I think one of the reasons that we have the scientific method is it recognizes the fact that we are doing research where we don't know the answers by definition. Right? We're not looking to confirm work that we already have accepted as fact. We are looking to really push the boundaries and make new discoveries. Doing so is fraught with error. In fact, my title here suggests that error is everywhere. And I think this is the stance that we have as scientists. So one of the things that we do when we're embarking on these new discoveries is we have this mindset that error can creep into our discovery process anywhere. And one of our jobs is to actually track and control that error Reason being that we want to understand the confidence with which we are actually presenting those results to the community. If it's an error fraught process, that's very important. There is meaningful information if I'm looking at a claim. If this is something where the errors have been very tightly controlled and um, uh, this would give you more confidence, right, in the actual claim itself. 
So what does that mean for the first and second branches? So they have well-defined um, ways that they communicate their findings. So the deductive branch, if you have, say, a new theorem you have uh, discovered, like let's just say, for example, for Matt's last theorem, what you don't do is throw that theorem out to the community by itself. Uh, what you do is you present the theorem to the community with the proof, right? And there's a very well-defined um, notion of what that proof should look like, right? It's not a, a few assertions. It's really um, a very tight-knit um, uh, logical sequence that leads to that theorem or whatever the lemma is or whatever it is you're trying to prove in, in the community. And that's how it's done, right? And similarly, for the empirical branch, um, we have an entire machinery of hypothesis testing use of appropriate statistical methods in a very structured way that we communicate that work, the methods and the protocols when, to the community when we present the, the results of the findings and the discoveries. So if you similarly, if you tried to submit a um, journal manuscript, like a manuscript to a journal, and you decided to, for whatever reason you just were gonna leave the methods section blank, you know it would get immediately rejected, right? <laughs> this is a requirement. And so here's, I think, our fundamental challenge in the computational community. What are our standards for a computational discovery that will allow us to really make that claim that this is the third branch or fourth branch of the scientific method? What's our version of the proof, right? And my argument is transparency in the computational process, access to scripts code that produced the findings, the data inputs that produced those findings, understanding how those were used and leveraged and what analysis were applied to produce the find. I think this is um, important for this claim around these branches of the scientific method and actually even a deeper claim that, that what we're doing is science itself when we're doing this computational research. Okay, so. Um, I'll just, this is just a very quick slide. I just wanted to give a little bit of the lineage of this idea. The earliest instantiation that I know of, of noticing these problems and uh, proposing solutions around computational research is from a now emeritus professor at Stanford, John Clairbout, who um, in about 1990 or 91, he stopped signing a student's thesis unless he could essentially hit return on the files he was given. He had a sort of stylized make file that he would have the students use. And, and hitting return essentially on their system would regenerate the thesis for the advisor. So <laughs> including the figures and so on. And there were some uh, ways you would sort of grade or classify the figures depending on how long they took to run and so on. But the overall um, uh, picture is that he, he, re, we, he would ensure this type of computational reproducibility as a condition of graduating the student. So why would he do this? Um, it's not because he found my talk particularly compelling. <laughs> you know, it's, I, when I asked him about it, he said, I noticed that students were coming into my lab, new students, and it would take them a couple of years before they were producing new results. And after I had this requirement in place around being able to regenerate the code, the data, the results for um, a student's thesis before they left the lab, new students were coming in and they were able to produce new results in a couple of weeks. And so this was really the motivation was around um, efficiency and sort of responsibility in terms of being an advisor. So students were able to come in and get up to speed on the work a lot more easily because the previous work was organized and computationally reproducible. So sometimes people ask me at this point about um, what if I'm just, what if, what if that whole thesis is garbage and you're just regenerating it? <laughs> you, know? you can regenerate terrible results all day long. It doesn't mean they're right. That, that's absolutely true. And so the question goes something like, well, wouldn't it be um, a greater service to science if we actually, when we wanted to check the results rather than regenerating them like that, we would actually re-implement them with new software and new data and so on. And the answer is yes, of course, right? Of course that would advance. That's a real contribution to science if I'm able to find additional evidence for or against a particular result. Um, however, you will not, even when re-implementing an experiment um, with excruciating amount of detail and so on, you will not end up with the same computational results down to whatever the eighth or 16th decimal points, whatever is, is your metric. So the, then the question is um, why are those results different? And are those differences meaningful in some scientific way? 
And so I think we do require this type of computational transparency in our work in order to be able to assess how close or how far different implementations actually are. So in a sense, I think we absolutely need these re-implementations uh, to um, uh, check whether results actually are appearing um, in a similar way as you may, may expect based on previous work, for example. But we also need to be able to have the ability to have that computational transparency, the reproducibility in the actual result itself to be able to understand and compare those pipelines when inevitably there are differences. So there's a, a quote here that sums up John Clairbout's approach to um, computational reproducibility. Now this quote is from 98, uh, this paraphrasing of Clairbout, and it says that um, the idea of really reproducible research, and that was Clairbout's words, the idea of really reproducible research is that an article about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship, it is advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete set of instructions and data that generated the tables, the figures, the results in the paper itself. So more and more, we are in this um, situation where the actual paper, the, the, the write-up of the work is this little tip of an iceberg on top of this huge amount of work that actually has happened in the computational space. It never really makes it into that publication. Okay, lots of people have noticed this. I just have, I'm not gonna go into this in great detail. There's lots of solutions that have popped up or, or attempts at solving parts of this very complicated problem. So these are all um, linked. It, I personally think if you're interested in this, it's worth taking time just sort of investigating some of these. I think it's very interesting that the vast majority of these efforts of uh, infrastructure solutions were developed by um, just researchers in their, um, day jobs, right? These aren't kind of industry efforts necessarily. There's a couple that, like Gene Pattern has Microsoft engagement. There's a couple in there, but in general, these are folks who notice there's a problem and tried to solve it. Okay, so very quickly, this is the AAAS um, workshop report that we ended up publishing in Science, and it had um, seven recommendations I'll mention very briefly. It is, um, like I said, 2016, and one of the things that we wanted to do is really elevate the discussion around software to the same level of the discussion, or maybe even higher, uh, both being raised, um, as a discussion around data, right? So there's a lot of talk around open data, but data always sits in a context that's very software driven, including connections to results, as well as just software to manage and access and analyze the data. So very quickly, our recommendations here, the first one, um, just getting the artifacts out there, sharing data, code, workflows, any relevant details of the computational environment, and putting this out in trusted uh, repositories, not on a researcher's website, for example, and then linking to those objects. So in a publication, just get those links in there. Journals may be catching up on this, but it's possible for us as researchers to just get those links in somewhere, right? In maybe acknowledgments or in the text, but even better is to have it in the reference section. Um, so citing, the next recommendation is really around citing, citing code data that were used in the production of these results, including your own. So if you wrote code, and maybe it's an artifact you're making available with the publication, get that citation in there. We don't have well-developed citation standards in terms of what it looks like to properly cite code or data, but just, you know, do your best. Get the URL in there, get the version in there. If you have a hash, like say, for example, maybe it's on GitHub, throw that in there and so on. And then we will be, um, we will iterate on that and improve these citation standards. But getting credit out there for this work, I think is really important. Um, documentation, also important, very big topic. I'm just gonna <laughs> skate right past it. But how we develop um, documentation standards for data and code, what our re reusability expectations are, this is all, conversations that are just sort of starting and getting underway now. Very interesting conversations. Um, license appropriately. So if you're putting artifacts out there, make sure you have some type of license on it that allows the reuse. Um, here we did recommendations around the, what I call the reproducible research standard, work that I had developed with my law background, and really being very permissive in the licensing regarding reuse of the scientific codes and data. Um, recommendation six says journals can help, right? So they can put, start to have um, standards around how they actually publish the work, how are they dealing with and coping with the artifacts. And some, some journals have actually, um, they are actually stepping forward and implementing some of this. Some journals are even doing a full 
execution of the code to check the reproducibility of those results in their publication. I think there's two or three that are doing that. And then our final recommendation here was that funding agencies should recognize this is not an obvious problem with an obvious solution. There are real areas of research to be done here. And notice that um, security considerations are just starting to enter this conversation. So that there are many questions even just on that topic. So having funding agencies focus on um, funding dollars to help solve this problem, we thought would be an another nice recommendation and thing to, thing to have happen. So Vaughn, I'm at 9.30. Does this mean that I can continue a couple more minutes or it, do people have things to do here? No, you should um, keep going, Victoria. We've got the, the full hour, but oh, I, okay. I expect questions and when you re reach a good breaking point, I've, I've got one to ask you. Okay, okay, wonderful. So we can do that now. I'm about to transition into the report itself or we can, if you think that your question would be better after the report, we can, we can do that. Well, I'll go ahead and ask it. It's from the chat room, and the, the question is verbatim. Uh, will you be discussing the challenges in reality to achieve the type of transparency and reproducibility in sharing scripts and code? Codes. Yeah, yeah. This, so this is, so this, it's a, this is a, a, a very important question, and we are kind of skating at a sort of high level, which in, in a sense is sort of the point of the talk to talk about where these policy changes were actually taking place. Um, so one of the things that I think is very interesting in this discussion is that um, sometimes you get uh, some resistance from people around this. I don't think, nobody really kind of rips apart um, what I've said in these first, whatever, 25 minutes. Um, the, nobody says reproducibility or transparency in science is this bad thing that we should, uh, you know, not worry about. But they say things like, okay, well, if we, if we or, or in, in sort of veiled ways sometimes, if we're going to be making progress on this, um, I don't want it to go forward in such a way where I feel like my research is constrained in some way, right? Like, I don't want to have extra requirements on me, and I, I want to be able to do something that makes sense for my research and my scientific domain, and I don't want there to be a heavy hand that comes down and says, thou shalt, th this, that, and the other. Even the word data or the word code, even, even like computational environment, these are so rich in terms of what they might mean in a particular um, project and so differentiable in the sense of their, so what code might mean in your, in your work could be really different to say a couple of lines of an R script in another project that uh, implements uh, a certain statistical test, for example. One might be really difficult to share if, if there are you know, particularly complex simulations. Sometimes these codes have been developed over 20 years and it, it's non-trivial to actually make that open source and also another question of how useful it is to make it open source. But, um, but that's much, much more challenging than say a couple of lines of a script that actually do some statistical tests, for example. So depending on where the actual, what the, what the research is doing, how much they leverage these computational aspects, it can be easier or more difficult to actually make progress on the transparency. And then um, one of the recommendations you're gonna see coming up in this reproducibility and, and replication discussion of this report right here is um, you, every action that we can take in, a, in the community is, um, it never stand on, stands on its own, right, around standards. So there's, on the one hand, you could see researchers saying something like, well, it takes extra work for me to prepare code data, you know, my entire workflow uh, for transparency. You know, I'm coming up for tenure or whatever it is, and uh, it's going to cost me maybe an extra paper or two a year to spend the work making my, my papers fully reproducible, and that could cost me, you know, advancement in my career. And I think I think I completely get that. And, and I think the community is very sympathetic to that. Um, it, it, if you push on that a little bit more, you, it, you get to start exposing things like, okay, so even if I did prepare code, data, make it shareable, you're even reusable to some best guess of what that actually means. Where do I put it? Is it okay to put it on GitHub? But where do I, like my data is like, you know, five gigs, it's not gonna go on GitHub. It doesn't even seem to make sense. So where do I put my data? Well, I could sort of maybe find some repositories. So we are still organizing ourselves in terms of stewardship of the, the work in terms of curation of these artifacts. And then, you know, if you have some type of executability, how long would you expect things to be executable? That's also an open question. So I think where we are in the community now is very much at the point of um, 
uh, figuring out what our gold standard might be, what our load stars might be, and directions and goals, and we're working towards there. So it's the right question to ask. It's the it's a, a complicated one for many reasons, and um, and we are going to kind of work there as a community. As, and I think some of these recommendations coming up will also you'll see how the thinking has advanced even in three years um, to be a little more. Um, uh, sort of a little richer in terms of how we actually start approaching those questions. But I would love it if there was just one single answer that we could just go and find and that would be it and it would solve the problem. Unfortunately, it's just not like that. There's a, another big uh, question, Victoria, if you'd like it now. Sure. Uh, quoting verbatim, I am a qualitative social scientist and we aim for reproducibility as well. It just means something different. Have you worked in this space do you have any thoughts on one, how you think reproducibility maps out into the social sciences, two, how social sciences can inform reproducibility in the computational space? Yeah, so this is a great segue to this, um, this next discussion. So I'm just gonna punt for one second here and um, get to the, the first slide. Okay, so, so these, the question raises these definitions. I'm gonna talk about the discussion we had around definitions in the committee. So there's a lot of text on the page. Don't worry about it. I'm going to um, uh, discuss it in a moment. But let me just give you a little bit of background on the National Academies Committee. So um, this committee was convened actually as a result of language that was in the um, bill that funds NSF. It's also the bill that funds DOE, for example. And a million dollars were set aside by Congress to actually um, carry out this study on reproducibility and replication in science was the title. And it was, as I mentioned, directed to NSF. So NSF used that money to request that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine convene a group of experts and actually produce the report, which is, this is what National Academies does. <laughs> They're an independent body. They were created by Congress many years ago to provide advice for, you know, government and society and so on, particularly on scientific matters, engineering, medicine matters. And so this is the kind of thing, exactly the kind of thing they would do. So they, they did take it on and they put the committee together and there's a, uh, you know, it's all on the web. Everything is very open. And I was one committee member. And um, we had a series of five in-person meetings and many calls, for example. And one of the things that happened in our discussions is that um, we realized that there's these words, reproducibility, replication, are highly freighted. And they do mean different things to different people. So we spent a lot of our time sorting out discussions that we could, uh, definitions we could work with in the um, committee. And a lot of these definitions have long histories and so on, and you know, different communities can use things different ways. So what we decided on for this committee, and I think these definitions actually do have legs and people are picking up on them, but we use the word reproducibility to mean computational reproducibility only. So the idea of transparency and computation, access to artifacts and computation, and um, understanding what happened in the computational aspects of the experiment that produced the result. So we wouldn't use reproducibility to mean anything but that in this report. Right? Now we distinguished from uh, computational reproducibility, replicability. Now replicability meaning I would actually be able to say, for example, re-implement your experiment and get to presumably comparable results, right? So this, our definition is we're, for replicability, we're obtaining consistent results across studies aimed at answering the same scientific question. But you wouldn't necessarily, in that case, rerun someone's code and generate results, for example. Okay, so, um, so I think what the question was talking about was replicability, not, not the computational reproducibility. Okay, so let me just mention, this is, the, this is the final part of my talk. I'll just mention some of the recommendations. Again, it's gonna be these word blizzards, but don't worry about it. I'm just gonna mention what the recommendations are. And I think it will tie together some of the questions and some of the earlier discussions we've been having, or, or I hope. Um, so the first recommendation is really around researcher communication. So for computational reproducibility, researchers need to convey clear, specific, and complete information about computational methods and data products that support their published results. So this is, as you just heard, pretty light on the implementation details. There's no blueprint on how to get this done. 
Uh, it's not appropriate for a report at this level to really be dictatorial about how NSF should take steps on this. I mean, NSF will figure out what works, but that gap is there, right? Okay, so it does say a few other things like we need to have um, data, study methods, computational environment. Um, this means input data and um, or if you have generated simulation data, for example, then you might be able to include the code that generated the data. And then it asks for intermediate results and output data for any steps that are non-deterministic or that are not reproducible in principle, meaning computationally reproducible. A detailed discussion, a detailed description of study methods. And now when it says ideally in executable form, what we're getting at there is sharing codes, scripts perhaps, or whatever was actually used um, for generating the results. Um, information about the computational environment. So this is details like operating system, um, any hardware dependencies that might be relevant, um, libraries or software dependencies and so on. Okay, so that's our first recommendation, um, really around exposing the computational aspects of the work. Okay, second recommendation is that the funding agencies, now remember we're thinking NSF, but we're making a broad recommendation around funding agencies, invest in research and development of open source usable tools and infrastructure that support reproducibility. Again, computational reproducibility. And this has, it's not that NSF has not made investments like this, but really being sort of very structured and deliberative about tools that can help bridge reproducibility gaps. So for example, um, I mentioned at the outset of the talk, uh, this idea of statistical reproducibility. So this is one of the statistical reproducibility underlies the um, big discussion that has been going on over the last few years about p-hacking, if you've heard about that one. So basically that's just a misunderstanding of what p-values actually are, what conditions you can actually produce p-values under, and, um, and just a misreporting of what the, like uh, uh, essentially a misreporting of what the conditions were that produced those p-values. Then and it leads to all sorts of overestimation of the significance of the results. And so for example, you could say one, there's many different approaches to how we can get at that problem, but one of it is tools, right? The tools are allowing people to do multiple statistical tests and cherry pick the ones they want without sort of tracking the tests and significance levels and so on. I could imagine a pretty easy tool that would allow counting of statistical tests and adjustment of p-value thresholds, for example, uh, around the work and the tools today just don't do that. So that's just one example of how tooling could actually start to make steps towards um, making our work more statistically reproducible. You could also imagine tools that um, help make work um, uh, computationally more transparent and gathering the actual steps that were taken. You know, we do all sorts of um, executions in the course of our research, not all are fruitful, right? So you could imagine um, sort of workflow software that could manage the particular runs that led to the results that you thought were the publishable results, for example. We're not interested in, say, all the typos. <laughs> so we don't have to grab everything. And so having tools that sort of help parse out, okay, so these were the parameters that went into those, um, uh, you know, visualization functions, whatever it is that you're using, I think this could really help move us towards um, reproducibility. We haven't in general, in the scientific community have that focus on our tooling in general. There are exceptions, but, but like that one page that I showed you, but in general, that hasn't been the way that we've done it. I mean, you, you think about the number of researchers that use Excel, for example, which is accounting software. It was never designed for science and doesn't allow reproducibility, for example. Okay, third recommendation, another word blizzard. So just blur your eyes and don't look too deeply at it. Um, they're really, the word blizzards are here really for completeness. Um, Okay, so um, these are directed recommendations towards the NSF. Um, they're saying things like NSF should set some criteria for what's a trusted open repository that scientists can put their artifacts in. Um, they may even want to develop these repositories themselves. So you might put something in an NSF repository. We threw that out there as an idea too. Um, we want to also have NSF 
uh, working with and harmonizing with other funding agencies like NIH, DOE, and so on. Um, essentially, there are efficiencies to be gained by doing that and learning that can happen across these different agencies. But also, we every nobody wants a situation where a researcher has a series of grants from different sources and finds themselves in conflict about what they are supposed to be doing to actually comply with these grants. So we do want to make sure this is harmonized. Um, extend the NSF data management plan to include software, include other aspects um, of uh, the computational environment that would enable reproducibility if, if they were um, more appropriately shared. And when there are barriers to sharing, like for example, you may have human subjects information in your data or other barriers, uh, proprietary code is of course harder to share legally than um, open source code, for example. But NSF can uh, fund research to try to ameliorate these barriers as much as possible. Like for example, are, is there work that we can do extending notions around differential privacy, for example, understanding ways to query data that may have privacy constraints in it and is not accessible. So we can, we can end up trying to get some of the benefits of reproducibility, even though plain open exposure of the artifacts may not be legally possible or ethically possible. Um, Okay, so this recommendation, this also goes to one of the questions. This is this, the kind of it takes a village recommendation, which is there are a lot of different actors here who have a role to play in um, shaping the incentives for the research community. So there are many stakeholders, educational institutions. Now this is around promotion, hiring, standards within the department in which a researcher works. Um, also professional societies, so in joining any, like ACM, for example, IEEE, any of these professional societies, um, what are, what is their role in sort of bringing about um, reproducibility through, for example, their conferences, their publications, whatever it is, their own training materials, their own working groups, and how they convene communities. Uh, researchers, funders, for example, we've talked about those a lot. So there's education and training that can happen also at the educational institutional level, like many of the, um, you know, work that's being carried out is deeply computational and deeply statistical and people doing it have just kind of figured out, figured this out on their own, which is no problem, except for the fact that there really are skills that can be very material on both the statistical side and the computational side in order to ensure quality science. So that we do have this gap as people sort of jump in to do computational work and data oriented work, um, whether there really is a depth of training in how to manage and uh, carry out this type of analysis. Um, professional societies, um, improved collaboration, for example, with um, experts in say computational aspects or statistical aspects or whatever it is. And um, NSF has a program called Harnessing the Data Revolution that has been around a number of years. And so the question here is, there could be activities happening within that program that can promote computational reproducibility. Okay, so grant applications. Can there be an emphasis, an improved emphasis on grant applications around expected uncertainties that would travel with um, any types of conclusions that come out of the work and how we would evaluate those uncertainties. Can we understand better how replicability, so the ability to redo the experiment and presumably have supporting evidence come out as around the result, although you, who knows, and also computational reproducibility. So are these three aspects, can they be um, in the proposal stage as part of perhaps review criteria and how would um, guidelines, NSF guidelines look for proposals if those were going to be, those three areas were going to be foregrounded more in the proposal. Okay, so that, those are the conclusions I pulled out. We had a, a, we had a few more recommendations in that report. I just sort of pulled out the principal ones to give you a flavor in our few minutes. Um, in conclusion, I'll just, I'll just make one observation that, um, that I think is actually a very positive note to leave this on, which is I see the um, computation that we are doing in science becoming increasingly more massive, much more ambitious um, computing intensive projects are on the horizon. Uh, we're not going to plateau or level out at any point. So ambitious in terms of scale and also in terms of pervasiveness across the research community. 
Now, another trend that I see is that research computing will become more transparent. It is becoming more transparent as journals and you know, reports like what we just discussed move the community or help to move the community towards greater transparency in our computational aspects of our research. Now, you might think those two forces might fight against each other. You know, like because it's there is work in becoming more transparent and as you become more computationally intensive the last thing you want is friction or drag and so on however i actually think these two forces will be self-reinforcing in the sense that you must have improved transparency as you move to greater complexity and greater scale in your computational work and simply if for no other reason to manage the jobs and understand what you did and understand your results so you can report them conversely this greater um, uh, complexity and greater um, pervasiveness of computing more intensive computing will also drive greater transparency um, and reinforce the transparency in our cyber infrastructure itself. So I think we're actually um, in a place where these two trends will work together to reinforce each other and that will help improve our computational transparency aspects of the research that we're producing. Okay, I will leave it there. So thank you for listening to me for so many minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Victoria. Looks like we've got one more question here in the, in the chat room. Great. Um, so English is the de facto language for publications, but we don't have a, a similar standard in scientific a similar standard scientific programming language. And they point out there's a long list of such languages. So sharing a, a code or workflow in an obscure language may not be reproducible, might be reproducible under the framework for which it was intended, but may be hard to verify and understand its logic, yep. um, which could hide some bugs or, or other issues. Do you have any, any thoughts along that lines and should that code be published alongside the logic? Yeah, that is a really good question. And without a doubt, people who work in more, I don't mean this in a pejorative sense, but more obscure languages. Um, they, so if you release a few Python scripts, that's much more accessible for the community than um, some type of, you, you know, you've dug up some version of Lisp from like, you know, 1982 or whatnot, and nobody really knows it anymore and so on. Um, so there's a couple of, you know, I think interesting ways that, I don't want to say unintended consequences, but I could see something like we become more, you know, homogenous in the languages we use. Now, is that good for science or not? I don't know, right? Um, and so there could be, I think in all of these discussions, we want to be really mindful of how this can actually impact the researcher. Your question started with, and, and the, the quality of the research that we're doing. So in your question started with uh, a sort of an interesting observation that we communicate our results in English. Well, we used to create our results in English, right? And uh, we don't generally create our results in English anymore. And so I would like very much to understand better what it would mean to produce a result in computation, right? And how that would then become part of the scholarly record. So the scholarly record is a group of PDFs written in English, as you pointed out, and um, they don't touch each other, right? They, they, they touch each other through English mechanisms like citations, you know, or discussions and references and so on. But computation is different and they could be much more tightly integrated in ways that really benefit science. So what does that future look like? I mean, so one of the things I like to think about is um, what does it look like to have a world in which um, uh, we have, let's just assume all of these uh, recommendations come true. Well, what does that world look like? What do we do with this world of radical transparency and how can we actually leverage and accelerate our science in that world? I think that's a very exciting thing to think about. A couple more, one comment and one question in the chat, Victoria. So there's a, a comment um, just asking for further references on this. And so in case you, you've got any, if you want to send those along, I can share them with the group. Um, so I don't mean to point only to my references. There are a lot of references here, but take a look at my website. Um, I put up my work there. I have all my papers there and they, I try to reference work that's like the recent paper Vaughn that we put together is on there, for example, which might be interesting to this group, for example. And, and the references in those then point, I mean, it's a little self-serving to point to mine, but that's an easy place to, to start for just as one place to start.
uh, as an invited speaker. I think that's totally appropriate. <laughs> Well, I'm just trying to say there's a lot more in the discussion than that, but if you want some places to start, that's one place. Um, and there's one question, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit with apologies if I get it wrong, but they're asking about uh, tension between reproducibility, transparency, and the need for commercial and licensing processes. You know, I, and they mentioned intellectual property, and so I think they're getting around the tension for some confidentiality on sort yeah. of the I, IP research. And curious how your, your studies are, um, are, are working in that, with that uh, conflict. Yeah, well, I have some bonus slides <laughs> you know, on that that I can point to really quickly. So um, this is a really complicated and rich question. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at one small part of it. Um, so there are, there are a lot of legal issues in software. You can see, so I have a little quote here on the screen, um, which is from our constitution to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So what does that have to do with software? Authors, software is considered authored. So that means it has copyright adhering to it just as uh, a poem you might write. And um, same with things like figures that you might produce for your paper or tables or whatnot. So, and what does copyright do? It, it, secures exclusive rights for that author to literally these are the words reproduce the work prepare derivative works upon the or based upon the original so if you think about what we're trying to do in science we're actually trying to do those two things that copyright prevents us from doing we want to reproduce others work that's a great thing right and preparing derivative works based on the original standing on the shoulders of giants also a great thing that we want to encourage in science so copyright which falls default on our software, perhaps aspects of our data, our data is a little more complicated, and um, our writings, our figures, text, media that we produce as part of science, it works 100% against our scientific incentives. So some of the work that I've done in the law capacity has really been thinking about licensing that allows us to work within an environment that adheres to our traditional scientific norms. So I'll jump, ooh, patents too, okay, I'll jump way ahead to, uh, to that, the reproducible research standard, um, get our media components out under attribution only licensing. That's, just, that's the closest I think we get to our scientific norms. Code components under similar, right? MIT license, modified BI, uh, BSD license, maybe Apache 2.0, sort of very lightweight licenses. And then data for reasons that I, I haven't had time to go into, it's just on the previous slide, uh, maybe use a CC0 public domain pro proclamation for your, for your data. And this allows and, and sort of pre-permissions people to go ahead and do things like reproduce your work, use it as an input into their work, so i.e. derivative work, standing on the shoulders of giants, and so on. So, I, so that's, a, that's a snippet of an answer that's very, very long to that question. Well, I think that's that's all the questions, Victoria. So let me thank you once again for a, a really interesting talk, and I really appreciate this. I, you know, the in the context of cybersecurity, as you know, you and I have talked about. I think this reproducibility is one of the key goals in the area of, of science for cybersecurity. Consider so. I really appreciate you coming today and giving this context not only to our fellows, but to the broader community. Oh, yeah. you're, very, you're very welcome, Vaughn. I, I, if I can just jump in on your, so, you know, one of the things that we talked about in the discussion today were things like we're just verging as a community on being able to think about things like what are documentation, what are software standards, and so on. And I think we're, right now is the sweet spot to think about the security aspects to exposing all of this code, for example, these computational environments. Well, I think with that, and I'll echo a few more thanks from the chat room, I'll ask uh, Diana to go ahead and, and end the recording, and we will go ahead and